First, I will talk to you about how to <clears throat> do, how to treat the data from your experiments to find every single point here. Imagine that for all of these black circles, you've done five experiments, you've done 100 experiments, you've done 1,000 experiments, you've done something to find that point in particular. That's maybe the average. Um, and then Chan Su later will show you the MATLAB uh, curve fitting toolbox and talk a bit about cur um, curve fitting to find the trend in your data. Um, yeah, so that's another way of saying what I said. Here the table. Right. So I started looking into statistics for, especially for one reason. When do you know that you're finished doing the experiments? How, what's your daily check? Like, okay, now I'm pretty confident that this is, this is it. It's no point in doing it anymore. And then also I was asked by the industry in some of the meetings that how do you trust the numbers you've come up with? What the basis for the numbers? So um, that's what I'm hoping to show you today, especially those two points. And this is taken from a paper I've been reading recently. And here I have a experimental data, he says, with a box showing you the average. And then there's the error bars, right? You've all seen that before. You've all seen the error bars before? So everybody who knows what the error bars is, raise a hand. OK. So I don't know, because he doesn't say. And it can be several things, I think. I would usually say that um, it should be the 95% confidence interval, or some confidence interval. Maybe you think it's the standard deviation, or the variance, or something like that. That's also typical to see in these kinds of plots. The point is that you have several possibilities when you make these plots yourself, these points. So that's what I'm hoping to show you today. Yeah. So first things first, you've sampled something n times. You want to find the mean. I hope that's OK. You know how to find the average of something. And then you can find the variance with this one, which is also hope most of you have seen before. No? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Someone looked confused, but OK. Um, and this is for the sample. This is what you've been measuring. And the true mean and true variance are often denoted, or for, at least for this one, denoted by mu and sigma squared. All right? So there's a difference between the population, which is the real thing, and what you've been sampling, which is just then hopefully almost the real thing. Yeah. So as I said, you could stop here. You could plot your box with your variance or standard deviation and say that you're happy. Or you could try to go further and say how, um, say more about the data based on what you do have done. Because if you've done a certain number of experiments, your variance may have stabilized. But there might still be some more information from doing several more experiments. And I'll show you that. So what you're saying is that the average I take from my data points isn't even the real average? No, probably not. All right. Yeah, you're all on board with that idea? That the average you get isn't the real average you're looking for? It's just almost? Yeah. So now I want to show you probability distributions. And some of you have heard of it before, I hope. For the others, imagine that you're taking first three experiments, you put them into histograms, and then you check how many percentages are in each. So for example, here, I see that between zero, minus one and zero, I have one, so that's a third, and I have two thirds in the other one. You repeat this with more experiments, put them in other, and you can see that you would get <coughs> some kind of distribution, like this. And you could also look at it the other way, as I'm most likely about 40% chance of getting around the mean, around zero. And there's some percent likelihood of getting out here, right? So that's how those are connected. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, good. Try to include that to not go too fast here. So if you ha actually have the probability distribution, you could plot it and say that if you have a mean around zero and a variance of one, it will look like the red one. If you have the mean somewhere else, 
it will look like this. And these are normally distributed. That's a common distribution for stuff you've sampled a lot of. All right? So two of the main reasons for why we're interested in looking at this one instead of other possible um, <coughs> distributions is the central limit theorem, which says that for a large number of samples, it is normally distributed, what you've been sampling. So even if it actually isn't, when you sample it, the sample becomes normally distributed if you do it enough times. And also, uh, if you look this up later, you'll see that you can use this even when um, <clears throat> a lot of the techniques that originates from this can be used for things that aren't normally uh, distributed, which is often referred to as robustness towards non-normality. So that's a th thing to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> now, since every system will have a different mean and a different variance, even though the shape is similar, you would get a different probability distribution for each system. So it would be really neat if we could convert that back into um, the same distribution that we've been looking at before, which is what we do with the unit normal deviate. Now let's just assume for a second that you know the true mean and the true variance. Then you could scale it so that the C would go from zero and out with a variance of one by that formula. <clears throat> and then, since we've seen this distribution several times, we could find the normal C, uh, C values. That gives us a probability that if I'm sampling one sample, it will, become, uh, <clears throat> it will show up between these two, right? So if the alpha is five, for example, you would go in a table, you'd find the two values that conform to that value. And you could say that I know with 95% uh, security that I will get a value between these two points. Yeah? Any questions so far? Not going too fast for anyone? That's good. So if you rearrange, yeah, and since this is known, you can find it from a table. I have a link for uh, the one I found on Wikipedia. It's the first thing that comes up when you Google for it. Um, all you need to know is alpha? All you need to know is alpha. So all you have to decide then, given that you, we'll come back to this, but alpha, the, the Cs are only dependent on alpha. Yeah, because they're taken from a distribution that's known. Um, so this is a graphical way of, of uh, t saying what I've been talking about, that depending on your alpha, you exclude the less likely parts. And the more sure you want to be that your <coughs> um, measurement is within this range, the, um, the bigger your C needs to be. But you could also make it smaller, and then you will just be less sure that it was there. right? So if it's 95 or 99 or 90, you could switch around. Um, so, all right, I'll stop here. <clears throat> what we would really like to do is say something about the true mean from the mean we're finding, right? So I would like to say that the true mean I know to be between these two points with some certainty. And then we're going to do a little thought experiment. Um, is that you imagine that you find several means. You do an experiment one day. Maybe you sample five or 10 times. You do it the next day. You do the same thing. You get two different means, right? You're unlikely to get the exact same values both times. So you can imagine doing that several times. And the thing is that then those means will also be normally distributed. That's the catch here. You, you got to follow that point. <laughs> and that's the only catch, in my opinion. But then <clears throat> um, these will be, the means would be have a variance or standard deviation that can be shown to be given by this formula. And then you could plug that, all that into the equation and switch around. And then you could have the true mean is equal to the mean that you found plus the alpha, the C dependent on your alpha, the number of experiments you've done, and the true variance or standard deviation. So the only thing we don't know there 
is the true standard deviation. So then you have to assume that the standard deviation from your experiment can approximate that. So that's really, we've assumed then that it's normally distributed and that our variance is the variance. Yeah? And also, what we managed to do, which is what I need in my experiments, is that <coughs> this interval gets smaller and smaller the more times you sample. So, in that way, you could know when you've got, gotten to a point, you know that increasing the n by another 10 wouldn't have a difference. So you, have, you can do the decision, do I want to do another 50 experiments or do I just want to finish here, right? So you can have a little more uh, information about how close you are to finding uh, a, likely, <laughs> a likely accuracy because you will always be limited by the cost of making uh, another experiment or the time it takes to perform them, right? So that's actually it for the confidence interval. So back to the error bars then. It could be any kind of confidence intervals, or it could be the standard deviation or the variance. Um, I really like it when it's this, because I feel like I know some, with some, I can say that this is statistically likely to be really true. Well, if someone just gave me their standard uh, variation, I wouldn't know what that means, have they done 100 experiments and gotten that one, or did they do two or three and just gotten a quite big one? And That would, could even mean that um, <clears throat> the true is uh, almost outside, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It really doesn't mean much. No, in my opinion, it doesn't. Not statistically. Yeah. Or at least probability-wise. So, since we've been assuming that the uh, distribution is normal, it could be, have, it could be nice to have some uh, tools for how to look at that. If you plotted all the thing in histograms, you could see that it started to approach uh, a shape that looked normal. But um, what I'm going to introduce you now is sort of tools like the mean and variance that say something about the shape of the distribution. I don't look too hard on this uh, yet. But the point is, uh, we, we define something called moments about the mean. So it's the expected value of your experiment minus the mean and to the power of k. Um, <clears throat> so for the first moment, k is 1. So the expected mean about the mean is 0. Right? You would expect to get the mean when you sample. The second, the top <clears throat> equation here would just turn into the same equation as the equation for the variance. So that would be 1. Yeah. Just feel free to ask questions if this is. You forgot to normalize it by the variance in your general equation. No, yeah, well, you have to. I didn't normalize it by the variance because I thought it was more confusing like that, but maybe it's more confusing like this. Anyway, the point is, and you don't really know how to do this, just know that there's some way you do this calculation and you can find the third and fourth moment that's the skewness and the flatness, which says something about the shape, which is a little more, little more subjective, a little, no, a little more objective, less subjective than just looking at a graph or a histogram. So for a normal distribution, the skewness is uh, zero and the flatness is three. And I'll show you what I mean by that. that <clears throat> if you find your skewness to be negative, it means that you have a tip to the, or you have mm, much of your data to the right of the mean or the tip. Well. All right, maybe I don't even know, but the point is it will look skewed. Um, and the same thing with the flatness that you could have bi-tipped like this when you have two peaks in your data, which is a bad sign. But if your flatness is almost three and you're assuming normal distribution, then it's not so bad. Then you might actually just keep going. Uh, yeah, so that's what I wanted to show there. And then I wanted to show you a technique because I know not a lot of people deal with experiments and get outliers. And then they look at their graph and then they go like, yeah, that's probably an outlier. I'm going to remove that point. I don't like it. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to show you that there is techniques, there is theorems for dealing with these kinds of uh, problems. 
where you at least can say that you leaned on something that other people know about when you decided how bad of an outlier it was or whether it was an outlier or not. So this technique in, in particular, you look for the biggest uh, deviation from the mean, uh, which is the delta n, delta max. And then you look up the tau, which is uh, a value depending on how many experiments you have. And then the, your standard deviation, you multiply those. And if, as the third point says here, if your biggest deviation or the biggest difference is bigger than tau times x, you can remove it. You can view it as an outlier and consider to remove it. And then if you want, when that's uh, removed, you could repeat the process. But then you'd also have to recalculate the mean and the variance, because those would change. And uh, <clears throat> I couldn't find a, an online table for this, but I found it in the American Association of Mechanical Engineering Test Uncertainty thing. Yeah. Um, so I think that was basically it for uh, my statistical theory part. Did you get that? Yeah? Then we'll move on. Um, anyway, I'm hoping to just show you that, or I'm going to show you, uh, that there's um, most of these things are already in MATLAB. Um, so I'll just make a stupid vector here. I call it stupid because I just make it now. Uh, so those who, are, who aren't familiar with MATLAB, this is of course, or for everyone, this is of course not how you would input your data into MATLAB, uh, but it's a way to do it. So I'll just do something like this. So now we have the vector and then. So this is basically five measurements you've made yeah. of some value, value of something. Exactly. Right? And then MATLAB of course has the mean and the variance like this. You can find those. And um, you can check for the skewness, even though this is sort of a few points, but it still looks sort of OK. So it's far from zero. It's not far from zero. Well, <laughs> and then you have to write good doses. Right. So. You don't have that many measurements, of course, if you have five, or for someone that's a lot. But as I said, uh, with the central limit theorem, that when you approach large numbers, which is a rule of thumb of 30 or something, that's when you usually use the normal distribution. So if you actually have this few, I would suggest looking up something else. So what do you do if you can't do 30 experiments? What if three is a lot? Well, there's. Um, that's not my area of expertise, of course, but there's other distributions that uh, account for more of the yeah uncertainties, I guess, so the distributions of the variance. But yeah, so there's the student t distribution, which um, <coughs> accounts for the variance in the standard deviation when you sample less, which approaches the normal distribution when uh, n is large enough. Uh, it gets uh, almost the same at about uh, 30, and then it's it's the it's the same at about 100. So it's but um, yeah, um, yeah. 20 minutes. Um, I was hoping to show something fun. Oh yeah, Brian wants me to do the confidence interval. I can do that. Um, so. I'll just look for the link instead. I'll just make a mistake if I look for it. So if you go through the link in the PDF or Google list yourself or look in any statistics books, you'll find the table of disease. Do you all remember what I was for the confidence interval? Yeah, and I won't go back. So these values represent the values between 0 to C. So for example, let's take someone who looks a little nice then. All right, if you go to so what a C. Are you going to, what alpha are you going for? 
I'm just at C zero. All there's nothing between zero and zero, like the mean and the mean of zero. So there's nothing, and it steadily increases. And that at a C at thirty, you have almost covered the whole of the distribution. And I happen to know that if we want 95 confidence interval, which is quite common, we're going to look for the one that gives 47.5% on one side, because then you have 47.5% on the other side. Yeah. And that's roughly around here. So our C then should be from one end, 19 or 1.9 plus 0 0.06. So we can call it C alpha is 1.96. And then the thing we, which <clears throat> are the limits of the confidence interval will be the C alpha times the square root of the variance of A. Yeah, and the square root of, because the square root of the variance of A is the standard deviation, yeah? And then the number of measurements, the square root of that. So if we bring up the mean again, if you did this experiment and got these values, and you assume that you could use normal distribution, and that your variance is uh, <coughs> applicable as the standard or as, yeah, as an approximator of the true standard deviation, then you would say that the mean is 2.96 plus 0 0.18. Yeah, plus minus, yeah. So that's what you would use so that, your error bar? That's what I would plot as the error bars, this value up and down of the mean. And what is the variance then? So if you would use the variance instead, or just actually the standard deviation then, yeah. I guess. It's a little bit bigger. So in this case, it's not that big of a difference. But, but it is different. It's different. It's not the same. So at least what I hope to show you, because all of you will probably read some uh, paper or something and see these bars, and then just think about what they could mean. And hopefully, they have written what they do mean. Um, so that you can try to get more out of the information that's actually hidden in the plot. Yeah? So if there's any questions for my part. For 95% confidence, then. Yeah. I want 95 then my Z alpha is always 1.96. Always. No matter what. That's why we normalize it into the C, because then we have all those Cs. Okay, uh, thank you, Eirik. Eirik mostly talked about multiple measurements of the same experiment, while I will focus more on, uh, I have done a experiment and then I have a set of data, two-dimensional data, X and Y. And this, um, this curve might look familiar to most of you because this is from the Excel. And then you did some measurements, X and Y, probably something over time, it looks like that, and then put it on Excel, and then just, you know, did polynomial fitting, and then obtained the R square. But what does it really tell you? Because doing experiments is very time and energy consuming, and it's just so expensive that you actually want to get more information from out of it other than just seeing some coefficients and very long equation and then R squared that it is not even explained within the Excel itself. So that's why I will focus more on the um, details of the statistics behind this curve fitting and their meanings and try to explain those. Oh yeah. Um, so we just l heard about confidence intervals uh, from the um, from IREC. So um, oh, we got the we got the coefficients here in the equation, and we don't even know um, the the uh, confidence intervals about those um, coefficients. So how sure we are about what we obtain about the relationship between these two? Um, so when and why do we need curve fitting? So 
most of the time you want to obtain the relationship between two variables, x and y, and for modeling and simulation purposes. We might also want to um, um, observe and obtain or estimate the values um, where there isn't actually data available. For example, between these two points that I don't actually have my measurements. But I would like to see how, my, um, how, how the behavior would be, so which is called interpolation. So I can uh, use this uh, curve fitting technique, interpolation, to obtain the value. Or I might want to learn how my um, function behaves outside of my measurement range, which is extrapolation. So curve fitting is something really handy. And I want to talk about um, some common terminology, which is mostly used in um, curve fitting and curve fitting statistics. So we, I have the x and y again. And I have observed or assumed that there's a linear relationship between these two variables. And so this is uh, the first equation shown in here. And I also have the um, error term E in here. So it is error, noise, or disturbance, depending on your background. Uh, so it is like an indicator of the deviation from the linear linearity. And I have my linear regression model, which gives me, uh, which calculates my y values depending on the x values um, with respect to the um, uh, model that I did the regression for. And the difference between these two, the actual observance and the value that I got from the fitted model is called residual. And so, or the error. And um, the sum of squared error is calculated with this formulation, which is an uh, indicator commonly used for the goodness of the fit. And um, another uh, common term is uh, root mean squared error. And this is calculated like this in the equation here. And sum of squared totals is the um, difference be uh, between the mean and the observance and uh, the sum of their um, square root squares. And R, and R squared um, is what we just seen in the Excel sheet was as the uh, goodness of the fit is calculated like this. So if it all makes sense coming from the linear relationship and going down to the R square, so this is how we obtain it and this is the actual meaning behind it. And uh, yeah, so how, what you're really yeah. after is the parameters in model fitting, right? That's your real goal is to find those betas. Yeah, well, I mean, unless I'm doing a, um, uh, I'm fitting uh, my data to a model that I actually want to see how my system behaves which, uh, or confirms that certain behavior defined by that certain model, then I also care about these um, errors and uh, R square. I want to know like how, good my system behaves with respect to this theory. So depending on your main purpose. And so I will introduce you MATLAB curve fitting toolbox today. And these are the main features of it. Curve fitting and surface fitting, curve fitting for 2D and uh, surface fitting for 3D data. But I will only talk about curve fitting uh, today. And uh, linear and nonlinear regression methods are the methods available for uh, curve fitting. And you can also do that with customized equations that I will show you in the application part. And so it has a great library of regression models with optimized starting points and solar parameters, like the um, uh, boundaries for estimate for, the, um, for your coefficients in the model. And it also has interpolation and smoothing uh, methods with their respective uh, methods and pre-processing, outlier removal, sectioning, scaling, weighting, and um, post-processing uh, routines as well. And I will only show, uh, briefly show confidence and prediction bonds because it is sort of relevant with the uh, confidence interval um, um, method that Eric talked about. Uh, so it also ha provides uh, features for uh, evaluation of the goodness of the fit, uh, evaluation of the fit. So goodness of the fit that probably like we are mostly familiar with. Uh, so it provides a quantitative um, data on um, SSE, R squared, adjusted R squared, and RMSE uh, right after you do your fitting. And uh, you can also do residual analysis, which was the difference between your actual observance and the value that you obtained from the uh, fitted model. 
Is that the same thing that the Deltas that Eric was talking about for doing the T-test? Uh, no. No? No, it is uh, for the uh, confidence bounds. Uh -huh. yeah. And confidence and prediction bounds. And in this figure, you can see a, what's going on here? Okay, uh, these are my data and this is my fit and these are the uh, prediction bounds for my fitted model. So they, they show you the uncertainty of the uh, boundaries and this is the residual plot. Again, the difference between the fitted value and the actual observance. It provides a good graphical understanding of your fitted model. And uh, I work with biofuels, so the chemicals are produced by the cells. So cell growth is very important for my research and I mostly work with them in the lab. And um, so to understand how they behave at different sugar concentrations, because they eat the sugar and then produce the chemicals. And I want the chemicals and I want them to produce as much as possible. So understanding how they grow on different sugars is very important for me. So I've been doing many experiments on that. And for example, at uh, nine different sugar concentrations, I measured their growth. And they, um, so uh, the, how did I measure the growth? By measuring the optical density, just refraction index, over time. So I took the data offline um, over 15 hours, every hour for nine experiments. But since, yeah, uh, I had different initial co uh, concentrations, they behave differently. But what what am I supposed to learn from it? Like, how am I supposed to quantify their growth and how do I go to modeling from this one? By curve fitting. And this is the cell growth model, uh, dx over dt. Uh, x is the um, cell concentration, uh, which equals to mu times x. Mu is the cell growth rate times the um, cell concentration. And uh, so as, as I just showed you in the previous one, I have uh, x over time and uh, so I did linear regression to estimate mu for every s. S was the initial sugar concentration that uh, I had nine different values that I just showed you the scatter plot. Uh, so I estimate the mu for linear regression. This is the first step of my um, estimation and then I take that mu value. I have nine for every different s and then fit them in here, which is my nonlinear model, which is Mono's model, which relates the uh, specific cell growth rate to the, um, sugar, uh, to the substrate concentration, which is sugar glucose in this case. And mu max and ks, mu max is the uh, maximum specific cell growth rate and ks is a substrate affinity uh, coefficient and these are my model constants. So I am aiming at obtaining them to understand how my cells grow at different sugar concentrations so that I won't have to perform my experiments at different sugar concentrations by obtaining these coefficients and save so much time and energy and money. And so this is how, how my um, growth data looks like over time. And as my um, growth the mu is this slope of this uh, highest growth phase and I have nine values and as I previously mentioned I obtained them by linear regression that I will uh, shortly show you in the MATLAB toolbox how I did that and after obtaining mu, va mu values for different s values I did my nonlinear regression with customized education um, introduced in the MATLAB uh, toolbox MONOS model and then obtain my model coefficients, Ks and mu max. So now I will switch to MATLAB to explain you further. So first, uh, I want to have my, I want to load my data to the MATLAB workspace so that so that I can start working with them. So I click on import data. And it is in CSV format. Um, most of the time from uh, online measurement um, equipment, you and I 
it's at least my experience, uh, get the data in CSV or Excel format. So it is convenient to know that you can directly, in fact, uh, import it to the MATLAB and then start working with those values. So I say import selection. Now they are all in here in my workspace. And then I go to the apps and open the curve fitting toolbox. This is how it looks like. And if I need to go back to this previous one, that how I did estimate the slope of each uh, growth curve, that I need the highest one for, uh, for biological reasons, that, which is, I, I won't explain because it is beyond the scope of this presentation, but I will quickly show you. And It, take quite, quite, it takes quite some time. And under this, within the same window, we can do several fits uh, using different types of data and applying different models and different methods. So it also provides you a um, tool for comparison. So these are how they look like. And since it was a linear relationship, I assumed first order polynomial. And you can see, yeah, linear model. In here, this is the result of the fit. And this P1 is my uh, growth, mu, and it is in here. And this P2 is my error in here. So you can see the goodness of the fit data, four of them, as I previously mentioned. And it gives a good, uh, good R square. So I have repeated this for all nine sets of experiments to obtain the uh, different growth rates. And if you want to compare them in terms of their goodness of the fit, you can export this one as a table. And uh, you can see the different uh, fits, their, their names and the data, type of the data and fit type. And some of squared errors are square and um, degrees of freedom of error, adjusted are square and root mean square error. So you can also categorize them like to see which one gave me the best, um, best fit. So after obtaining these, uh, I would like to visualize how I got to the point, <coughs> this point, uh, with uh, nonlinear regression with the custom equation. So I can name my fit, for example, mu, versus S, and my X data is my S sugar concentration and respective growth rates. Mew. Where did those come from? Did you load them in? Yeah. So they were in the MATLAB workspace. So whatever variable you have in the MATLAB workspace, you can okay. work with them in the curve fitting tool. So and these are the available models, exponential, Fourier, uh, interpolant linear fitting, polynomial at different orders, uh, power rational, variable sum of sign, etc. But I will go with the custom equation since I already know how my equation looks like. And since I already have it in here, I will just copy and paste. and see how they look like. So um, it has a funny look. Probably it has outliers, but since I haven't performed the tau test, as Eric described, because I didn't know him before that, <laughs> uh, so I didn't want to remove any outliers. But then if you have done the test previously, and then if you know which one of those are your outliers, it has a feature for outlier removal. And you can just remove the outlier and see how it affects your goodness of the fit and your coefficients. Another important thing is after you do your fitting, the model, the fit results provides you the coefficients with the um, confidence bounds. 
uh, by default it is 95%, but you can also specify it of whatever of your choices. So it gives a good feeling. And as I mentioned before, you can also draw the residual plots, how much of a diversion from uh, your actual observances, and draw the prediction bounds calculated with these uh, prediction bounds on the coefficients. So you can just zoom out and see how it looks like. It has a funny shape, but probably mathematically it's not good enough. And yeah. So you can uh, directly save your figure of your fitted model with the feature in here, print to figure. It is like any other MATLAB figure and then you can edit different, uh, different features for viewing or draw things or add or delete things of your choice. You can also uh, generate code. You have done your post-processing and then you want to store the data uh, as, a, uh, as a MATLAB code because you might want to use this uh, function directly, for example, for further simulation and modeling purposes. So it is convenient and it is very descriptive and it is uh, very nice to work with. And you can have uh, other uh, extra options like in here, you can see the excluded points, options, method, uh, which points are excluded, or you can define a weight matrix, for example. You can also um, customize how you want to plot your uh, fitted value with your data on the top of that. So this is what I wanted to show you about the curve fitting toolbox. And here are the summary of what we talked today. So Eric, mostly, uh, Eric talked about the basic statistics, basic terminology that you might need to know when you're treating your experimental data. And I talked about curve fitting statistics and then introduced you the uh, MATLAB curve fitting toolbox. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, we are happy to answer your questions.